Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, the um, May version of the um, Hopkins ALS Clinical Trials Unit um, Lecture Series. I'm uh, really uh, thrilled today to have uh, Dr. Katie Nicholson, uh, who's an assistant in neurology at Mass General Hospital and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Katie received her MD degree from George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences and completed a neurology residency at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. She then went on to complete uh, her fellowship in neuromuscular disease at, uh, at Mass General and Brigham and Women's, and then a clinical research fellowship in neurodegenerative disorders at, at Mass General. All of this really has made her into um, uh, an expert when it comes to uh, clinical trials and clinical trial research. She's been very involved in creative clinical trial design and is one of the um, really emerging leaders in the field of, uh, of ALS clinical research. So she, today she's taken, undertaken a challenge that's um, uh, a really important project, and that is to follow familial ALS patients um, longitudinally. It's a project that's taken a lot of time to design to execute. She's been a great collaborator. I know not just with us, but with a number of um, groups around the country. So um, Katie's talk uh, today is called Early Markers of Disease and Familial ALS. And Katie, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, excuse me. Um, should I share my screen? Great. Wonderful. Um, so uh, I, as uh, Dr. Marigakis mentioned, um, I am one of the um, ALS clinician researchers at the Healy Center for ALS um, at MGH. Um, and um, over the last several years have really started to focus on uh, working very closely with families um, who are affected by the disease, both clinically um, and through my research um, as well. Here are my disclosures. Probably the most notable disclosure would be my time um, uh, with a fellowship in therapeutic development uh, between MGH and Biogen for two years. And I was part of the um, drug development team at Biogen for the phase one to a person study and the phase one C9 ASO study as well. A quick outline, um, I will review some uh, candidate early markers of disease that we're excited about for familial ALS um, in the pre-symptomatic um, state. I will talk about my work with a study called the DIALS Network, and then I hope to inspire you with discussion about uh, something called the Prevent ALS Initiative that we hope to start up soon. In terms of background, um, I always like to ask, why are we doing what we're doing? So why should we care about early markers of familial ALS? Well, 10% of ALS is familial, about 25% attributed to the C9-ORF72 repeat expansion, about 20% attributed to the SOD1 mutation, and then several other genes of less common frequency. ALS genetic discovery has really exploded since the 1990s. Um, and this is really thanks to improving technology um, in terms of uh, detection techniques and exciting large genomic discovery studies such as ANSWER ALS. There really is an outrageous delay in ALS diagnosis. The average time from symptom onset to diagnosis is about a year. Um, and as you can see here in the, in the diagram below, um, it takes about four months for individuals to present after uh, initial symptom onset to their primary doctor. And then about seven months for them to then receive a diagnosis of ALS. And up to 50% of patients will have at least one incorrect diagnosis before ALS. We hope the discovery of early non-genotype specific markers of disease onset in people with familial ALS could be applied to sporadic ALS and help move up this delay in diagnosis. Let's talk about the first biofluid marker of interest in early ALS, and that's neurofilament. Neurofilament is released from neurons upon axonal damage and neurodegeneration. There are two flavors, so to speak. Uh, phosphorylated uh, light and heavy chain in terms of neurofilament. And this is not specific for ALS. Um, this is an important study that was uh, published back in the Green Journal in, in 2018, which really talked about neurofilament in early and later ALS. And as you can see here, uh, we have a CSF neurofilament light um, on the left. We have CSF 
of phosphorylated neurofilament heavy in the middle, and we have serum neurofilament light on the right. And in each of these diagrams, um, it delineates individuals with ALS um, for less than six months. That's what they define as early ALS. ALS greater than six months, that's what they define as later ALS. And they compare that to other neurological diseases, motor neuron disease mimics, and other motor neuron disease. Um, and as you can see, neurofilament was significantly increased in both early and later symptomatic ALS. Neurofilament has also been shown uh, to be particularly informative in terms of symptom status and survival. As you can see here on the far left, CSF neurofilament levels are higher in individuals with C9 or C9 or 72 related ALS compared to people uh, with uh, non-C9 ALS. Um, then as we move to the right, CSF and serum neurofilament levels were also found to be elevated in people with C9 ALS plus or minus uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia and individuals with C9 frontotemporal dementia compared to people who are asymptomatic and, and harboring the C9 repeat expansion. As we move uh, further to the right here, you see a strong correlation between higher neurofilament levels, as shown here in red, and shorter survival after disease onset. And in the far right here, we see that longitudinal neurofilament levels are relatively stable over time and predict uh, disease status. So you can see the individuals who are indicated in blue are individuals who are fast progressors, um, individuals in green, those that are defined as slower progressors, and individuals who are asymptomatic um, in, in red as well. Um, I know we have Dr. Benatar on, on the call as well, and I, I very much want to acknowledge his uh, fine work in this space. Um, he published this in the Annals of Neurology in 2018. Um, and this is work from his pre-fall study at the University of Miami. Um, what he was able to show is that um, CSF and serum neurofilament light levels were highly correlated and that baseline serum neurofilament levels were comparable in controls and asymptomatic gene carriers. Longitudinal neurofilament light levels were also relatively stable in controls in ALS patients. But most notably, um, in a small number of symptom converters, seven with SOD1 related um, uh, gene mutation and one with FUS, again, these are individuals who are asymptomatic and then develop symptoms, demonstrated an elevated serum neurofilament level um, up to about a year prior to development of symptoms or phenoconversion. And that continued to increase through the first six months of symptom onset. A similar pattern was also observed um, in the CSF. And this is the basis for um, the very exciting Tofersen um, Biogen um, IQVIA uh, uh, SOD1 prevention trial that's just about to start. I believe Hopkins is a site uh, for that study as well, uh, where individuals are followed in terms of their um, neurofilament um, levels on a monthly basis to see if the disease process might be starting. Um, the second group of, of biofluid markers that I wish to bring to your attention are called chitinases. And these are expressed by activated microglia and astrocytes in the central nervous system and may be reflective of glial activation. There are two different chitinases that I'll talk about today, <clears throat> chitinase three-like protein and CHIT1. And these are also not specific for ALS. They've been found to be elevated um, in other disorders such as Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. And what you see here um, is some information um, looking at the CSF um, for both of these two um, types of chitinases. And what was found is that increased CSF levels were increased in ALS compared to controls, both disease controls and healthy controls. Um, unfortunately, no diff differences were noted in the plasma. Um, so this was just in, in the CSF. On the right, what you can see here is that CSF levels for both chitinases correlated with rate of disease progression. So the individuals on the far left indicated in red are the fast progressors with a higher level um, of uh, both of these two types of chitinases in the spinal fluid. Um, so why are we then interested in, in these two biofluid markers? Well, neurofilament has potential for use as a biomarker of symptom conversion and prognosis and to assist with earlier diagnosis. For chitinases, has not um, to this date been um, looked at um, in 
the pre-symptomatic population, but we are working on that now. Um, it has, uh, based on the data I just showed you, of use, potential use as a biomarker of prognosis and potentially early diagnosis in the CSF. Um, so we're interested hey, in also- Hey, sure. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Do, you, do you see any more power or can you combine those two markers? Um, does that give you any more power? It's hard to know. So um, in this paper um, that's cited here um, that was published by Bob Bowser's group and uh, Len Petroselli's group last year, they actually did compare neurofilament and chitinase um, uh, levels um, and they looked quite comparable. Um, in terms of a, a correlation. Um, in terms of being able to use both for uh, prediction of symptom onset, I think we're not quite sure yet. We wanna certainly take a look at that. Um, I think you're also asking in, in other cases, um, like individuals who are um, developing symptoms um, in terms of predictive value for fast progression or survival, I think we're not quite sure yet as well. I think those, that data is still emerging in terms of how we could potentially combine but um, I would, you bring up a good point. I would certainly envision a world where we probably have a panel of these biomarkers. If someone's coming in with early symptoms um, to run and uh, perhaps uh, with a, a combination of elevation or changes, um, there might be a higher predictive value. My, my guess is some of these studies have, have been done on different patient samples as well, right? So it's probably right. hard to, right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's also tricky. <laughs> um, yeah, so Katie. Um, similar to Nick's, it's a little different. Those values, granted, I, this is an early study, those values in fast, intermediate, and slow, they're massively overlapping. I wouldn't, that doesn't look promising for truly as an individual value predicting anything yet, unless your numbers really separate those. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, those, those bars may look different, but the, the spread of those points are just um, not encouraging. I would say, unless you can really split that higher. Yeah, I would like to look at a higher N as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, a higher sample size, um, but I absolutely agree. I think there's a lot more data for neurofilament. I think the chitinase data is emerging, but the um, studies have been relatively small. So one of the things, and I, um, you might've been at the target ALS meeting, a well-known marker for not really microglia, but certainly astroglia would be GFAP. I'm surprised no one's done GFAP. It's well established in other fields as a marker for CNS injury. And it, there's assays that are readily available. It, this gets back to Nick's idea, you know, could you multiplex things? And, uh, you know, I would, I would vote for GFAP well before, sorry, chitinase, because it's a defined marker um, for astrocyte dysfunction, astrocyte injury. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly on our radar. <laughs> Um, we're also very interested in looking at immune profiling. Um, so looking at um, in this population, um, uh, we know that, uh, so in, in the symptomatic population, if I take a step back, we know that there are abnormalities that have been well-defined in, in T regulatory cells. We're just starting to define the abnormality we think is present in, in B cells as well. Um, and we also wanna look at the gut microbiome. In addition to a lot of inflammatory markers, in the CSF, um, in the blood, um, and in the gut in terms of different metabolites as well. Um, so uh, certainly I think we wanna expand greatly on this. Um, in my discussion with, um, I think it was Stan Appello a few weeks ago, um, he actually suggested, you know, gosh, uh, we're really going on, on what the findings are in symptomatic ALS, why not do kind of a blinded high throughput screen, um, which is also, I think, a, a great recommendation um, in terms of how we might be able to define um, uh, with larger numbers, of course, um, uh, looking at these um, potential early markers, things that are not quite on our radar yet as well. But I agree, I'm, I'm not quite convinced about pregnancies yet. Um, and what I'm showing here is really um, our, our data, our pilot data from years ago, looking at um, ALS patients um, and showing that there is an altered gut uh, with a decrease in butyrate producing bacteria um, compared to controls. And we're, we are repeating the study um, longitudinally in people with ALS, but at the same time, we are going to start to look at um, people who are uh, pre-symptomatic over time as well. But great points. Um, and really, I think what we're all aiming for here um, with early biomarkers 
is an opportunity to prevent the disease um, and to develop um, more powerful tools. And there, there are powerful genetic fo focused therapies that are really on the horizon. If we detect an early biological change, we could start someone on therapy really before ALS starts. Um, and one of the um, uh, most exciting, I would argue, therapies that has emerged is the um, uh, tofersin drug um, at Biogen with SD1 targeted therapy with an antisense technology. And what you see here is, is data from um, their published uh, a New England Journal article, which looks at the ALS functional rating scale revised. Um, uh, just a, a reminder for those folks who aren't um, uh, routinely using the scale, this is a scale that's out of 48 points and the higher um, the scale, the better the function. It looks at um, speech and swallow or bulbar function, fine motor skills, gross motor and breathing. And what you see here in the middle um, is their data, um, again, a very small N, so take this with a grain of salt, uh, for the ALS functional rating scale revised, um, and they separate out the data over time. So this is up to 85 days in individuals who are fast progressors who receive uh, placebo in blue, and individuals who are fast progressors who receive tofersin in orange. Um, and what you can see here is there is a, a, a higher rate of decline or change from baseline in terms of this functional rating scale in the placebo group. Um, so we're very interested um, to see when this study reads out later this year uh, with a much higher end in terms of individuals who are treated with the 100 milligram dose. Again, this is from their phase one slash two study. Um, there are uh, more uh, genetic focused uh, treatment trials that are um, on the horizon and starting up. Uh, one is the phase one plus study. There's an ongoing C9 or 72 ASO study and a taxin 2 study um, as well. Um, we have several other C9 ALS focused non-gene therapy studies that are also starting up later this year. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're already starting uh, prevention trials um, with this tofersin drug and that will start up um, shortly um, within a matter of days, I think in a, a number of institutions. Any questions about that before I, I move on to dials? Um, so I would appreciate the opportunity to tell you about a, um, a project of mine um, that has been ongoing since 2017. Um, it's called DIALS, that stands for the Dominant Inherited ALS Network. Um, and our goal here um, is uh, really aligned with um, a lot of the goals that were presented earlier in this talk um, in wanting to define the earliest clinical and biological changes in ALS. And we really found that um, when we started the study that there wasn't a widespread platform for individuals um, to undergo testing for ALS causative genes who were asymptomatic and at risk. There were a few studies, but um, not uh, widespread throughout the country in terms of location um, and patients were asking for that. Um, and people are very interested in learning their gene status. Um, there are a lot of implications for this to be in the clinical space. Um, and that includes uh, what a positive gene status can mean in terms of um, implications for life insurance and long-term care. Um, so right now, um, it really is important to have a, a supportive research platform that provides a CLIA or clinical grade testing for these ALS causative genes and supports these individuals as they're undergoing this um, understandably anxiety provoking um, process as well. Our second aim is to uh, perform longitudinal evaluation of these individuals um, over time, again, to identify biomarkers of disease initiation and early clinical outcomes. And really, and this is for preparation for uh, prevention trials um, for all genes um, involving individuals with familial ALS. Um, and this is an initiative that I co-lead with Dr. Timothy Miller at Washington University and Dr. James Berry here at Mass General. Um, our current goal enrollment is 200 asymptomatic potential gene carriers. As I mentioned, we have two sites, um, MGH and Washington University, and we perform a CLIA or clinical grade genetic testing of all known causative genes. Um, and we perform that testing through the New York Genome Center and have um, made sure that that genomic information is part of, of their initiative for ALS genomic discovery as well, um, that Answer ALS uh, was a major part of too. So that was important that we were in a de-identified way providing this data to the community. 
Um, it's important to know that the familial ALS community really has a history of working together in a consortium approach. So we were a part of a target ALS supported C9 focused consortium that just ended last month um, that brought together the Mayo Clinic in, in Rochester with Nathan staff, um, Dr. Benatar at University of Miami with multiple studies, pre-falls, pre-ALS and create. Um, our study with the Dials Network and then other collaborators, including um, NINDS, where Mary Kay Flouter was still there, um, and the Lefties All FTD Consortium. Um, and of note, this was really led by Len Petroselli at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Um, so just a note on how our study works. Um, so uh, individuals, when they come into the study, they don't actually have to learn their gene status. And this is very similar um, to other pre-symptomatic studies that are run. Um, individuals can decide to learn their gene status, and that's called disclosure, or not dis decide not to learn their gene status, excuse me, which is called non-disclosure. We remain blinded to what individuals want to know, and the data is linked on the back end. And essentially, individuals can decide that they want to change their mind at any time uh, with additional genetic counseling or as uh, the field evolves. Um, in terms of the visits, our visits are roughly every six months. Um, the genetic testing occurs at the um, initial screening visit. Um, the results are available at approximately the three month mark. We're testing um, for about 35 um, ALS related genes and then we give people the opportunity to, to learn a, a set of non ALS cancer causing genes as well. Um, and then individuals will follow up at the six month mark. And there's a lot of genetic counseling that happens around uh, the time of the uh, genetic results disclosure. We also have the opportunity to bring people back at any time if there is a concern for symptoms um, or a concern for mental health as well. Um, and so uh, we have an ability to do an ad hoc visit. In terms of the activities that we do uh, for uh, biofluid collection every six months, we collect plasma, serum, and whole blood, PBMCs, urine. We have an optional spinal tap once a year, which um, interestingly, uh, most of our individuals in the study are on board uh, with doing, and we have an optional skin biopsy as well. Um, in terms of outcomes every six months, we do perform the ALS functional rating scale revised. We do breathing testing. We look at cognition with the ALS Cognitive Behavioral Scale and the NIH Examiner. We do a bulbar screen uh, looking at um, different aspects of speech and swallow. So we do the CNS bulbar function scale that was used in the new DEXTA trial. We do a quantitative speech analysis um, that we hope to actually turn into an app soon. Um, and we use an IOP device that looks at the strength of the lips and tongue. We also do several forms of strength testing, um, the traditional handheld dynamometry, um, and we're also directly comparing that to the Atlas device. And you see here, one of our um, Dials participants is um, sitting in the Atlas chair and doing uh, strength testing with one of our physical therapists. We also make sure that individuals are well supported. Um, we ask them about their mood and quality of life throughout the study. Katie, is the skin biopsy with a specific target in mind or is that is that to make IPS cells or to do metabolomics? What would yeah. So uh, it, it depends on the collaborator. <laughs> um, so uh, for a while we were providing um, the skin biopsy um, and uh, fibroblasts to um, Kevin Egan at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and he was um, making iPSCs. Um, uh, for a while we were also uh, providing um, a, a, um, this uh, a type of sample to Lem Petroselli and he was working on his PolyGP um, validation um, in the blood too. So. Um, really, we're, um, I should mention, we're interested in working with anyone who has a need for some of these samples. It might be worth talking to Giovanni Manfredi. I mean, Giovanni had a nice publication looking at, you know, potential for sporadic ALS, IPS cell fibroblast, um, uh, sporadic ALS fibroblasts and looking at mitochondrial function. So he's been very keen on that. That might be worth reaching out to him. He has the infrastructure in place to, to maybe think about that. Absolutely, absolutely. We're always looking for a collaboration. So that would be wonderful. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, we're, we're happy to. And we're happy to amend our um, manual procedures. Um, I know a lot of individuals collect PBMCs in different ways, depending on what the use is for. So uh, we're certainly adaptable <laughs> in that respect. 
Um, so I do want to mention that dials enrollment and retention are high. We have 126 participants enrolled. We actually now have about 60 people on our waiting list to come in, um, which is exciting, um, and we're trying to get them in quickly. We'll talk about our uh, hopes to expand the study as well um, at the end of this talk. Um, we have um, 46 individuals who are um, have tested positive for the C9 or 72 repeat expansion. We have seven individuals who tested positive for SOB1 and a number of individuals who tested positive for other ALS causative genes with results pending for 14. And we have um, two participants who harbor um, more than one gene. Um, we have 119 individuals who are continuing to participate, four left after finding that they do not have an ALS gene, although they referred other family members um, to us. And there um, have been, unfortunately, three individuals who have passed away um, from um, ALS um, in the study. Um, what is uh, also important in the study, you know, while we hope that individuals don't develop symptoms um, for their sake, converters, symptom converters are uh, quite informative. And um, we have had six individuals develop symptoms, um, five who harbor the C9 repeat expansion, and one individual who had both SOD1 and SQST M1. Um, four of those individuals had ALS, two with FTD. Um, I, I do want to note that we're actually not showing the data from the individual who developed SOD1 ALS um, after this slide. Um, that individual was in the Topherson phase one and then open label extension. Their information is um, exciting to look at, but we um, want certainly that to a person um, phase three to read out before we um, share that data with Biogen. Um, what we have found is that converters on average may be in their 40s and above. Penetrance may vary depending on the ALS causative gene and the presence of modifiers. Um, what we've seen in the study is that C9 has really predominated, but we will learn about all ALS genes and um, also that people may have more than one ALS gene and that may not be known if individuals were only tested for the most common ALS genes. Um, we're also learning that we will enhance our work more the more and more we work with our FTD colleagues, particularly with the genes that overlap in terms of uh, risk for FTD. So, hey, Katie, sorry, I, I might have missed this. I'm doing this on my iPad. Um, did you do whole genome sequencing on these people? Yes. So you, know, you also will know then the whole genome variants. Yes. yes. Do you know if anyone's looking at that? Because we already know um, an answer that with 10 variants, Steve Finkbinder, uh, he hasn't published this, can predict 85% of sporadic ALS patients. Wow, that, that's incredible. I don't think so, anyone's done that yes. yet. Um, or genome, you know? I'm yeah, just, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I know the also, uh, or sorry, the ALS genomic discovery mm -hmm. New York Genome Center. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that this data is um, pulled for our, our research community um, as well um, and, and kept in two places. It'll be kept in the New York Genome Center as well, but we'll also offer it. Um, and, and perhaps Jeff, we could talk about maybe sticking it with answer if that could be helpful. Yeah, so, um, yeah, just as a point of fact, all the New York Genome Center data is moving to the answer ALS portal. Excellent. Um, they're closing down the um, ALS component. So we're gonna take it over at some point. We don't know exactly when, but we'll be moving it all. Um, so that, but we can talk about that some other time. Sounds great, but that's, that's an, a, an, a very important point that you bring up. <laughs> we would love to look at that. And there's no one, that, no one that is looking at that quite yet. Okay, thanks. Um, here are some of our baseline characteristics for 120 of the 126 currently enrolled individuals. Um, our average age um, is about 48, um, which is right in the ballpark um, that we would be um, uh, looking at for a potential conversion. Interestingly, we do have a female predominance in the study um, with only about 34% of individuals who um, are male. Um, and then you see our kind of baseline scores here, which um, I'll show in, in more detail in a few more slides in terms of um, how these play longitudinally. Uh, and 95% of our individuals remain asymptomatic. Um, so one question that we want to ask, uh, and we wanted to ask when we were starting the study is, are traditional ALS outcomes sensitive enough to pick up early changes in ALS? Um, we're trying to figure out the biomarker side, but we also want um, to be able to identify what outcomes would be most appropriate um, in a prevention trial. Um, for example, 
or in an early ALS trial as well. And what you see here on the left is our ALS FRSR total score um, data. So this is our, again, our standard um, uh, ALS uh, clinical trial outcome. Um, and this is over time in months since baseline. And this is really color coded um, by their symptom status. The individuals who developed ALS are in black, the individuals who developed um, FTD are in red, and the individuals who remain asymptomatic are in blue. And the lines become dotted up, up, upon conversion, excuse me. And there's a little bit of overlap here um, in terms of um, the individuals who uh, converted in terms of uh, difficulty in seeing, so I apologize for that. Um, what you see here is there's a little bit of variability with the individuals who um, remain asymptomatic um, as well, but it may not be the, the best um, uh, outcome in terms of uh, picking up um, an early change in ALS. I do want to note the in, this individual here in black who seems to plummet in terms of the, their ALS functional rating scale, unfortunately developed head and neck cancer around that time, so that's likely not attributed to solely um, ALS um, as well. Um, and uh, looking here on the um, because we are interested in not only looking at um, physical function, but we're also looking at cognitive function for our individuals who harbor um, a gene that could potentially lead to um, a dementia as well. We started looking at the ALS cognitive behavioral scale, and this is looking at the total cognitive score and their baseline score in coming into the study. Um, and this score, the higher the score, the more normal. Above 17 or above this green dotted line is considered normal. Um, below the blue dotted line is considered concerning for FTD. And between the two lines is a, the cognitive impairment range. And what's particularly interesting here is that a lot of our individuals who are G negative, and, and quite frankly, some of them are young, are scoring in the cognitive impairment range. And we actually started to look at this in other factors. We looked at subscores, we looked at um, multiple other factors, including mood. And we did find that these individuals tended to be more anxious. Looking at this, this is not necessarily the best cognitive me measure, particularly for this um, uh, population. Um, and so we added um, in the middle of last year, um, a, um, a type of outcome that is performed on an iPad. It takes about 30 minutes. Um, it's called the NIH Examiner. It was developed by UCSF. And really, um, we want to directly compare it as a cognitive outcome. It has a lot of validated use in different types of dementia, including FTD. Um, it's being used in pre-symptomatic familial FTD. Um, there's a lot of data in healthy controls. There's a lot of data in individuals with uh, different psychiatric disorders for comparison um, in case there's a, a question of, of confounding as well. Um, but it's also being used in pre-symptomatic Huntington's disease um, to look um, for the development of cognitive changes there as well. Um, so we're continuing to collect data. We don't quite have a year's, a year's worth of data. Hopefully we'll take a look at that data um, next year. But that's a, a, an evolving question. How can we best um, look at um, cognitive function in these individuals? And there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, some studies in the FTD community will do a comprehensive neuropsych evaluation. That takes a lot of time. Um, so we are working very closely with uh, UCSF um, and really um, uh, uh, leaning on their guidance in terms of the most appropriate measure for this population. So stay tuned. Um, I do wanna give you a glimmer of our um, strength data. And this is looking at our converters only um, comparing um, handheld dynamometry seen here as HHD and the Atlas device. And just to take a step back for individuals who are not as familiar with these um, different types of strength measures, the handheld dynamometer you may have seen in clinical trials, it's a handheld device. For example, if we wanted to test someone's hip flexion strength, um, we would put the device against the skin um, or against uh, the pants. Um, the uh, patient would press up as the examiner presses down. Um, and that would uh, read out with a, an objective um, a number. Um, and essentially this is normalized based on um, height, weight, um, age, and gender. Um, in terms of um, the issue, uh, particularly with this patient population, is that a lot of individuals don't have issues with their strength and quite frankly might be athletic. <laughs> um, they may be stronger than my examiner or me. <laughs> Maybe I need to go to the gym a little bit more. Um, but you may not pick up the individual's full strength if the individual is stronger than uh, the person examining them. 
and it may not kick up a, a, an appropriate change over time for that reason. And so a couple of years ago, one of the Neil's uh, physical therapists developed this chair that you saw in previous slides that an individual sits in, it's called an atlas chair, and it essentially isolates the muscles and provides isometric strength testing where it helps to take the examiner's strength out of the equation. So we were very interested in how this would perform against the, the handheld dynamometer. Um, what you see here on the far left, um, and these are fake IDs, by the way, they're not real IDs. Um, uh, what you see here on the far left, this is an individual who um, had a bulbar onset um, ALS. We only have one time point so far. Um, this individual here um, has developed um, FTD. Um, the individual in the middle developed slowly progressive um, limb onset ALS. And as you see, looking at the atlas in red and the HHD in blue, um, really there seems to be a, a parallel decline. It, it does appear as though the HHD is picking up the decline. Um, this individual 798 is an individual who developed FTD. It's, this has been particularly informative over the last several years because there have been some complaints of tripping and, and catching their toes and trying to see is this a, are those symptoms uh, cognitive related or are they more um, uh, the onset of ALS? Um, and it appears so far in conjunction with routine EMGs um, and other types of testing that this individual um, has symptoms that are more likely related to their FTD. Um, but here on the far right, this is kind of interesting. It, it does appear as though the ATLAS device is picking up a little bit of decline, that the HHD is not. Um, so it does beg the question um, for uh, individuals like this individual with limb onset ALS, um, perhaps there are some individuals for whom ATLAS may pick up the changes sooner. Uh, we need a lot mm -hmm. more data, a lot more converters, of course, but this is just a, a, an initial one. So Katie, before you go on, you probably don't know this. Um, Dan Drachman, who set up the neuromuscular unit at Hopkins, started using what was then a mechanical HHD. It's been used, everyone who trains at Hopkins has used this, I think since the 1980s. Um, and then we converted to the electronic ones, these little Apollo capsules, once they became available. This is well known to us. And in fact, the group here has published years ago on the variability between intra-individuals uh, sorry, between individuals using, and we all know that using HHD, there's about a four pound variability from um, just measurement to measurement or between individuals. But it's uh, it's really standard here for, for everyone who does neuromuscular. Obviously for the, the Atlas, well, before the Atlas was a different version of the chair that was used in the early nineties as well for clinical trials. The Atlas version is nicer, but for your average neuromuscular clinician, the HHD is really an excellent tool for following muscle strength. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I agree with you. I'm not arguing here that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater with HHG. Um, I, I think that a lot of us coming into it were assuming that Atlas would be better. <laughs> and what we're seeing here is it, it may not be. Um, and HHG is a, a, a little bit easier to do. A lot more individuals across the NEALS network are trained. With HHG, the Atlas device um, can be expensive. It, it has been provided to sites that were part of the Centaur trial, but it does require maintenance over time and continuous training. So um, it will be interesting to see where this hashes out. Um, and it would be a lot easier if it was towards um, HHD. <laughs> and that one. Yeah. So stay tuned. <laughs> uh, we're also looking at, uh, as I mentioned, uh, speaking and um, uh, quantitative speech analysis. And this is in conjunction with Jordan Green's lab at um, the MGH Institute of Health Professions. Um, and we're again, interested in, in maybe turning this into an app, but here's just kind of a glimmer of what we're looking at. Looking at speaking rate and words per minute, what you have on the far left is our G negative cohort, our asymptomatic cohort in the middle, and our converter cohort on the far right. Um, and you see the uh, normal cutoff of 150. So above 150 would be considered normal. Um, and this is color coded by gene status. Um, and a couple of things strike me when I initially look at this, and again, this is preliminary data, there's a lot of variability, um, particularly in the individuals who are gene negative and comparing that to individuals who are asymptomatic. You even have someone in that gene negative category who's kind of skirting that, um, uh, that normal cutoff. Um, we're using again, fake IDs here, but there are two individuals in the asymptomatic group that are kind of close to that cutoff. 
um, one with um, C9, with one with um, SUD1. And we are keeping an eye on this um, as well. Um, so uh, stay tuned, uh, we'll see where this goes. Obviously easier um, to do it and, and uh, with the, a higher uh, likely sensitivity if we were to do this more frequently with a home measure on a, a digital device. Um, so I want to show you some of our uh, uh, biomarker data. Um, I have to say I was hoping to be able to show you all of our biomarker data. Um, there has been a little bit of a delay with um, uh, the testing kits and some of the supplies for neurofilament. Um, so unfortunately, I have a subset of data for neurofilament and a subset of data for kinases to show you. But um, it's hot off the press as of this morning in creating graphs. So um, I'm excited to show you. I will start off by showing you a, a graph from our analysis two years ago um, when we looked at this data. Um, and this is in conjunction with um, Len Petroselli and, and Tanya Gendron at um, the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And we looked at longitudinal neurofilament in all of our participants, but here we're focusing on the C9 converters. Um, and what you have here on the left is the CSF NFL levels. What you have on the right is the uh, serum NFL level. And this is in months since conversion. This is color coded by symptom status. The individuals in red developed uh, C9 ALS. The individuals in blue, or the in one individual here, um, excuse me, um, developed C9 FTD. Um, and the vertical line indicates the time point for conversion. Um, and what you see here, and, and note that we tend to collect uh, serum every six months and CSF once a year. Um, so that's why there's a, a little bit of a difference in number of time points here. Um, but this individual who has a higher neurofilament level in comparison to the other individuals had rapidly progressive vulvar onset disease. Um, the individuals who are in red with C9 ALS who have more modest levels of neurofilament have more slowly progressive um, limb onset ALS. Um, and that is more comparable to the individual with C9 FTD. So this is interesting. Again, a very small number of individuals. Um, we're um, hoping to look at this again this year, and I hope to be able to show that data to you um, later this year. Um, but uh, this begs the question, um, are we only going to pick up um, fast progressors uh, with neurofilament? Um, are there other biomarkers that we can look at or put into a panel that can potentially um, capture these slower progressors as well? Um, and so again, this is a very crude snapshot uh, created by myself this morning from data we received yesterday. This is partial data, so not our full set. Um, looking at neurofilament light in the CSF on the left, looking at plasma, um, neurofilament light on the right, and then you have our pa three panels for each graph with ALS, FTD, and asymptomatic. Um, and this, again, is color-coded uh, by gene status. I wouldn't draw many conclusions here. Um, again, this is just a crude rec uh, representation, but what is striking to me is the variability that we see um, in particular, and I, I hope to show you the full data set later this year. So Katie, with that patient, um, let's see, plasma, NFL plasma, and one patient goes from, let's say, 2.8 to 3.2 nanograms per mil, uh, further to your right. Yeah, just- This one here? No, I'm sorry, the patient with ALS. Okay. Yep. Dotted line. So is that really enough to, is that really enough to pick up? Do you think that's a meaningful increase from month six to 24? It's hard to say. I mean, you, uh, compare that to the variability we're seeing on the asymptomatic side. You have some asymptomatic individuals, um, even one who's gene negative, who has kind of comparable levels. Sure, they're not increasing. Um, it, this one here, you know, kind of increased and, and then came down again. Um, it's hard to know if that change, that um, delta, is would be enough to um, trigger, for example, someone's involvement in a uh, prevention trial that had a cutoff for uh, a change over time um, right. as well. I think that's the question that you're asking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, it looks, it looks like it's going up, but, you know, when you look at actual numbers, it's such a small. It really is. And this is log transform. Oh, yeah, a, okay. okay. um, a couple things. One, this again begs the um, question about having another marker to say, well, if you index two markers, what would it look like? I, obviously, there's no answer to that. But actually, more importantly, there's this assumption that it should just sort of go up serially. 
this is not necessarily a synchronous disease. It's not like when one cell goes, oh, then three more go, and then 10 more go, and then 12 more. We don't, you know, it can, you, you know from your own patient population, we, we know from our patients that it can be sort of sporadic. Um, mm-hmm. One set of neurons goes, uh, others seem to be stable. So there's no, the gut assumption is that it should go up, but it's not synchronous. And you can have a few neurons that pop, I'll, I'll use a crude expression, and fine. That doesn't mean that there could be three, three could pop, and then a little later, three more, but that's not going to increase your yeah. yeah. dead and gone. There's no more neurofilament. Right. So it has. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that, that then the, you're right. And then that just that makes begs the question about how 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 can it be used, right? If, it, if you don't see some kind of. Well, it is back to the fast progressors. The fast would probably show yes. up again in an arbitrary idea. It's okay, three go, but then another five and then another six somewhere else. Now another 10 because it's moving so fast. But the slower progressor, it just may be too intermittent, a series of cells that are going or releasing NFL. Right. So it may, it, who knows, one could predict it may never be very good for a slower progressor. Right. Because of that. Right. Absolutely. Um, want to also show you, again, this is a sub, very small subset, an N of 12 of just our asymptomatic group that came in this week. Um, we'll be testing, obviously, on, on our full subset. But this is looking at our two chitinases and, and just showing data from the CSF using um, the normal cutoff as indicated by the dotted line here. And this is uh, color-coded um, based on gene status. We do have one SOD1 carrier who appears to have, um, in comparison to the other individuals tested, um, a higher chitinase level. Um, that individual then did not have an elevated level of this um, CHIT1 um, as well. Um, and then of note for um, this type of chitinase, our individual um, who harbors VAPB um, had a, an elevated level in comparison to the other individuals who were tested who were pre-symptomatic. <clears throat> and that individual did not have an elevated level of the other type of chitinase. So obviously we need to look at this in a much larger population. We'll look at this in our entire dials population. Um, there also appears to be a lot of a lot more variability here with this chitinase in comparison to this chitinase um, as well. Um, I think there's a lot to be desired in terms of looking at this data, um, and uh, we need again to look at a, a higher number of participants. Um, we will be directly comparing it to neurofilament as well. Uh, Katie uh, Young Ji Yang asks, uh, will neuron or CNS specific microRNAs be looked at from serum samples as potentially early markers? I believe Tim Miller, it will be um, considering working on that. He's, he's looked at mirror 123. So yeah, he's going to, um, I believe, start to look at that soon. Great question. Um, and here's something I'd like to present to you that is, um, again, this is also high, uh, hot off the press, excuse me, and is uh, not published. Um, so um, this is uh, uh, something that builds on the work from Dr. Mark Albers, um, who is an Alzheimer's researcher here at Mass General. And he's been looking at protein kinase R, um, which is um, uh, the phosphorylated form um, is actually the activated form and the ratio is no, most specific. So that's why we're most interested in looking at that. And in his initial work, which is pending publication right now, um, the uh, testing of the CSF for this uh, protein kinase R and its phosphorylated form found that um, the ratio was elevated in about 97% of ALS and 100% of the individuals who were tested uh, with C9 ALS, and this was all from samples from the Niels Bio Repository. Um, it was only uh, present in about 50% of sporadic um, all, um, uh, ALS, um, and also um, uh, about 50% of Alzheimer's um, too. Um, he did look at one individual uh, who had familial Alzheimer's about a year before they developed symptoms and that individual was also positive um, for this marker. Um, so we were very interested in looking at this in dials and we just did an exploratory N of two. Um, and that's what I'm showing you here. And, and of note, this, this PKR, this protein kinase R, indicates an increased interferon pathway signaling in the brain. 
And um, as I mentioned, it was found to be elevated in the CSF of people with senile ALS. So what he kindly provided here on the far left um, is representative of what we would consider positive controls. The individual on the far left is someone who um, has Alzheimer's disease. This individual um, to the right in that panel has senile related ALS. Um, and these levels are considered elevated for the ratio. In the middle of uh, the individuals um, are considered negative controls. We have one individual with sporadic ALS and one individual who's a healthy control. And then on the far right, we have two dials um, pre-symptomatic C9 carriers, both in their 30s with an elevated um, a ratio. Um, both, both would be considered elevated. He's also looking at other markers of um, inflammation in the CNS. Um, and uh, one of those markers um, is CCL2 or chemokine ligand 2, also known as MCP1, which is a marker of inflammation and recruitment of monocytes in the central nervous system. And both of these um, two individuals who had a high ratio also had a high CCL2 as well. Now, um, I would stay tuned for this. This is the basis of an upcoming clinical trial involving a drug um, that targets the interferon pathway that will hopefully start up later this year. Um, but we will also be planning on looking at the entire DIALS population um, so that we can um, really ascertain whether this is something that would be um, of, of interest um, as a marker and also if the, um, the compound that's going into clinical trial would be of interest um, to uh, prevent ALS as well. Um, so I do want to take, I know we only have a couple of minutes, I'm going to uh, fly through these slides, but I do want to inspire you uh, with something that um, we've been talking about here at NGH um, with our colleagues um, at Columbia and uh, Dr. Benatar also um, at University of Miami. Um, and it's an, an exciting initiative called Prevent ALS, which I think is a much better name than DIALS. <laughs> um, and uh, really uh, want to um, increase RN. Um, we wanna work together. We wanna bring together these studies um, that are pre-existing um, in some shape or form, whether it's a consortium or whether we're truly merging studies. We also wanna dramatically expand what we're doing um, um, on that level as well. Um, so just with um, the amount of time I have left, um, I, I do want to mention this is a whole new population of individuals we're working with. Um, people from families that harbor an ALS causing mutation tell us that they're highly motivated to help. And this is a, a truly a partnership. And more partners means more data and, and bigger discoveries. And I, I beg you to think about it for a moment. If 10% of all of ALS is familial, we then reframe our focus on all of the family members of those individuals. And suddenly that number balloons closer to the number of people with sporadic ALS who are at risk for developing uh, familial ALS. Um, so the impact um, actually is, is much bigger than one might initially think. Um, I'm going to move through this slide quickly. Um, these are the three ongoing pre-symptomatic studies in familial ALS really initiated and, and um, uh, uh, kicked off by Michael Benatar's innovative work at the University of Miami with Prefalls, the ALS Families Project with Neil Shiner and Matt Hearns at Columbia, and DIALS, as I mentioned. And the first step is really to harmonize the current efforts um, with um, focus on, on how we will um, collect data and in sample handling. Um, and we really want to build an ambitious program that um, uh, builds upon the success of these existing um, pre-symptomatic studies expanding to about 10 sites and, and over a thousand patients, which we think will be meaningful in terms of the number of converters and what we're able to um, understand um, as well. We wanna incorporate the key lessons learned from the ANSWER ALS infrastructure, um, of course, um, uh, particularly in terms of um, uh, handling of complex omics um, and uh, bringing together um, multiple sites and, and making this data um, available as well. Um, and I do want to mention um, as a kind of a, a final note that we are proposing two collaborations as well with um, individuals who have really uh, led the way in um, uh, uh, genetic discovery and then stem cell collaboration in ALS. Um, and that's really working with Bob Brown at UMass to identify new genetic modifiers of ALS onset and disease progression and creating a stem cell core um, with Clive Svensson at Cedar sinai 
banking PBMCs for prevent all prevent ALS uh, participants. Um, Clive really came to us with a, a kind of an exciting um, notion um, where um, this has been done in, in cancer, um, where we would take the PBMCs of symptom converters and in a petri dish um, apply environmental um, risk factors that we're worried about um, for people with ALS um, to those motor neurons to see if there is an effect on um, the timing of symptom onset um, or abnormality, abnormalities that are seen on a molecular level um, with those um, iPS cells. Um, we can also do that with genetic modification as well. So we're really excited about that potential collaboration. Really, Answer ALS led the way for collaborating with Clive um, as well. So um, we're thankful to that as well. And really want to um, uh, bring up our sample size. Um, this will really make an impact, I think, in, in what we're able to um, discover and um, also potential uh, therapies as well. Um, and I know I'm one minute over, so I'm just going to um, end there. Thanks, Katie. That was uh, that was terrific. It sounds like you've been very busy and have a, a lot going on. So it'll be it'll be great to see these these projects come to fruition over time. So I'm really happy that you're in, in the ALS space. Okay. Um, so thanks again. Um, uh, I will add that um, uh, if, if there are no more questions, um, I will add that next month, I've asked Lauren Elman from the University of Pennsylvania to talk about primary lateral sclerosis. Um, and primary lateral sclerosis, for those of you who don't do a lot of um, ALS clinical research, is probably under both underappreciated and, and not clearly well-defined. So she will um, help try to navigate that space. So I encourage you to join us um, next month. Um, Katie, thanks again for um, a, a great talk, and um, we'll look forward to hearing more from you. Oh, hey, you Katie, before you go, I, I, I knew a little bit about Prevent. One comment you should discuss among the group, the, the idea of Clive doing environmental stressors, which is sort of a novel idea, you have to keep in mind the most environmental toxins, they get metabolized first, mm -hmm. and then they cause injury. So it's not like you directly put paraquat on neurons and that's the same as what really happens in the human body. So you might um, noodle on that a little bit. Yes, we're gonna have to think through that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's an excellent- Anyway, point. thanks, that was great. That was a great overview, really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Well. Thank you thanks. so much. Thanks, Katie, thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.